Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you probably heard, I was in Europe this weekend at the ESA Open Day at the European Science and Technology Centre. And yeah, I was presenting, but of course the weekend started with some ceremonies for the VIP guests, who included a couple of Apollo astronauts, such as Walter Cunningham, who was the first on the Apollo 7 and therefore was one of the first Apollo astronauts to fly in space. In the town of Nerdwick, near the centre, they have the Walk of Space, which is kind of like the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but with astronaut handprints in machined titanium. This is Alexander Gerst, who, if you remember, he was commander of the space station last year, and he used those very fingers to touch space when he covered up a hole in the space station. That reminds me of actually something that uh, a little boy asked me only a few weeks ago. I was on a PR, and I was a small guy, Coming to me uh, saying, uh, Mr. Gers, I, I would like to become an astronaut, but. And, and he must have probably seen like photos of me and Luca and Andre Farfetch uh, in the internet. And he said, I would like to become an astronaut, but do I have to shave my head? <laughs> And then there was Rusty Schweikert from Apollo 9, who really understood the significance of this honor. That I get coffee for free at s -Tech for the rest of my life. And that's a great honor. This was all on the Saturday before the actual open day, and there was an evening with the astronauts and various other people talking about, you know, space stuff. Be the biggest thing that is wrong with all space movies is things happen very fast, you know, things are whistling around. Space flight is actually majestic, slow and majestic movement. The only thing that comes close to that is the initial uh, uh, approach of the spacecraft to the spinning wheel in 2001. That's the only one where That's they the have that speed. beautiful... Yes. Okay. And then on the day off, there was a, an opening ceremony, so we had to get there extra early before the crowds to prepare. And yeah, I was I was forced to hang around backstage with all these astronauts. So you can imagine how hard that was for me. The weather was cold and very wet, but I'm not going to complain because right now I could really use some of that where I live. But that did not stop these hardy Europeans from turning up to see some awesome space stuff. And apparently some of them turned up because they wanted to say hi to me. And I was more than happy to say hello back to them. Yeah, we had a very full talk. Which was great, unless of course you're my buddy Xavier, who's actually trying to get me to go places and do things and talk about stuff. I had to keep on reminding myself I was there to take pictures. What's our plan then? Uh, Dog. What? Dog, because we we're, have we have Matt here, so we're we're, yeah. we're supposed to do a walk and talk. So walk and talk around some of these missions. <laughs> yeah. You should yeah. say hi to us later. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always it's great to see you guys. Great. Right, this is a busy one, Scott. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we're in yeah. the main area in uh, Essex now. Uh, actually, it's the main canteen. But today, during open day. This is the part where the science directorate showcase all of their missions and the most recent missions that are about to fly or are in flight now. So maybe we can mosey on through. Maybe I could introduce you to a couple of my colleagues. Great, let's find them. Okay. So the first biggie, uh, I would say, is this one here, Solar Orbiter. And it just so happens that the project scientist for Solar Orbiter, Daniel Muller, is over the back there. Maybe we can get a word with him to describe wow. the mission. Getting in close to the sun. Getting in close to the sun. Because I mean, we're all probe with uh, with uh, NASA now. This was kind of a, an ESA partner mission to to work in concert with yeah. scientists. I mean, we're all technically solar orbiters. Yes, indeed. I, there's indeed, not many yeah. things that aren't solar orbiters. But this one's a particular solar orbiter that's really going to get in close. It is a massive technological challenge to get that close to the sun. Um, yeah. You can see that from the spacecraft there with all the uh, protection. Yeah. So a particular design. I mean, I'm really wondering, do these solar panels fold back to reduce the heat no, flux? No, one of the things I have to do is tilt a lot of the time. So they're using the same technologies of Beckham oh, Columbo so, so yeah. as well. So they're, at different times, they can, you know, with the orbit, sometimes they have to be fully on, um, you know, normal to the sun to get the most power but when it gets close they'll tilt them to reduce the, the, the solar flux and, and for, for thermal regulation reasons. I think the same thing that's uh, done on Bepi Colombo. Right. Because yeah. it's such a challenge to get close but also be far away from the sun. 
Um, because you know, your solar cells are going to degrade and they're they're just not as efficient once they get too hot. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's that was the biggest one of the well, the major challenge with Beppe Kamba and also Solar Orbiter. Can I grab you, Daniel? Hey, Can Daniel! I introduce you to Scott Manley. Hello, I'm Scott Manley. I make videos on the internet about space. All right, so, and I'm really you know fascinated by Solar Orbiter. <laughs> How can I help you? Ah, well, uh, how close is this going to the sun? This is going as close as planet Mercury. So okay, like Baby Colombo then? Like Baby Colombo, that's right. And, and so you get a ton of instruments on it, they all have to point through the heat shield then? Or? That's right, we have, we have cameras and uh, five out of the six cameras look through the heat shield. <coughs> yeah. So we have little apertures to make them peak through uh, this uh, shield that protects the rest of the spaceship from the heat. And then we have one imager that images the corona and that looks over the edge of the heat shield. So I mean, the whole point I'm hearing is that this yeah. thing is going to be able to get up close yeah. to the sun. It's going to yeah. be able to look at essentially events and weather on the surface of the sun and try That's to right. correlate that with in situ measurements That's of exactly right. the yeah. solar atmosphere. That's right, yeah. Which is just in situ measurements of the sun, like sticking your finger in the sun to get science. That's right, yeah. And what we've had so far is good, let's say, photographic evidence of things that happen on the solar surface mm -hmm. and measurements close to Earth of properties of the solar wind. And you're trying to bring these two We're trying together. trying to connect the two and establish, a, let's say, a causal link between what happens on the surface and what happens ultimately close to Earth. Yeah, I like how you said connect the two mm -hmm. because a lot, a lot of the energy yeah. comes from things like solar, you know, magnetic field reconnection mm -hmm. event, right? Mm -hmm. So the the launch of this is in the planned it's, or it's imminent. It will be in early February. Early February, early 2020? February 2020. The on, spacecraft on what? will be shipped end of this month, okay. end of October by plane to Cape Canaveral to Florida. And it's going to launch on what? It'll launch launch vehicle? on an Atlas 411 rocket. 411. So that's one of my favorites because it has one uh, solid rocket booster. That's right. Which means it has to basically power slide off the launch pad. It goes up and sideways. That's right. That's yeah. how badass it is. So, yeah. 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 And that'll uh, take it off into the orbit. And then how does it get all the way down to Mercury? Is it a single boost or does it have uh, extra it, propulsion on board for... No, it only has, let's say, an, an early, what they call a coast phase with a center or upper stage. Right. But then after about an hour into the orbit, it'll just be on its own and just fly according to uh, uh, gravity mechanics, laws, right. orbital mechanics, and then swing by Earth and Venus a number of times to, to shrink it, bring the it down orbit and bring Mercury. it down to, to Mercury orbit. Okay, and uh, the nominal mission is going to be four years with possible extension up to maybe eight years in total? That's right. The, the design lifetime is 10 years. Okay. And the idea is that after about three months, we'll start taking the first data. Mm -hmm. After about two years, we'll start what we call the nominal mission phase. Right. And that will last for four years with okay. the option of uh, further extensions. Yeah. Um, and over the time of the mission, we'll gradually reach higher inclination to take the first pictures of the poles of the sun. So as time goes on, you're going to like lift the latitude of the orbit or the inclination up to like 35 degrees that's, by that's 2030? Exactly right. That's exactly right. I read it off the screen. That's <laughs> <laughs> I well, can understand the orbital mechanics well, on well there. That's, that's right. So the, uh, that part, that, that's about the, the, uh, the poles of the sun, which have never been photographed before, will get increasingly exciting towards the end of the mission. That's really cool. So, and has it probably has small reaction control thrusters on board to just adjust the orbit and exactly. make sure you hit those encounters. Exactly, okay. exactly. So we try to, uh, as Americans would say, fill her up <laughs> and with with uh, enough fuel to uh, to accomplish that as as often as possible. Usually, you have a lot of margin for the initial orbit insertion, meaning that you you assume that you don't launch the rocket exactly at the right angle, so you need some extra correction to get it yeah. point in the right direction. Right. Usually though, these people do a splendid job in getting it right on. They do an amazing <laughs> job. And what that would mean is that we might end up with more reserve uh, in terms of fuel. For a longer mission. That could then, uh, exactly, result in a longer mission, which is scientifically what we want. Yes, we want more science as much as possible, so yeah better technology gets us there for longer. Thanks, Daniel. This has been great. Uh, I really look forward to the launch of this, especially since it's a 411. So, yes, have a great one. Fly okay. safe. <laughs>
Now, I have a bunch more interviews that I've got to assemble, but I also just stopped randomly and found awesome things that space nerds would love. This is the drop test model for the Intermediate Experimental Vehicle, which was kind of the next uh, space plane that Europe looked at. And it is actually being turned into something called the Space Rider, but the IXV is the only spacecraft to have performed a lifting body re-entry from orbital velocities. Now, this is a drop test model. This one didn't go to space. This was mostly to test the parachute and the flotation bags and other hardware. So uh, what it is, is it's a blunt body, lifting body. It has a lift to drag ratio of about 0.7. It's designed around providing as not enough space in its payload bay that you can put experiments and have them fly in space for a couple of months before they fly back and land on the Earth. Uh, it controls its re-entry using a pair of body flaps at the rear of the spacecraft and by a set of 400 newton reaction control thrusters using hydrazine monopropellant. The reaction control thrusters are of course needed to provide three axis control while the spacecraft in orb is in orbit, but during re-entry it'll also use the reaction control thrusters for yaw control because those two body flaps they can perform roll and pitch, but that doesn't give them any scope to perform yaw. Now this particular one is just the drop test model, the fins or the body flaps on the back are fixed. This was primarily to test that the parachute would work. And the parachute I hear that on this is the same parachute that the F-111 twin sweep bomber would use for its uh, crew escape vehicle. That whole th In that case the whole cockpit pops out rather than just an ejector seat. So those parachutes would of course deploy and you know let it land softly in the water uh, looking to the future the space rider is going to have a very simple similar vehicle geometry but its parachute is going to actually be a para wing or a para foil and it will be able to fly down and essentially land horizontally at a speed of about 100 kilometers per hour so if all goes according to plan we should see the next generation of this the space riders flying in maybe 2021. It'll fly on top of the Vega C rocket, which is the uh, Vega rocket, but with a bit, well, basically bigger and better stages. So anyway, yeah, this is part one of, I don't know how many, because we have lots and lots of videos from this event, a lot of different uh, scientists talking about their projects. But uh, I'm gonna leave it here. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.